How dreadfully dull is it to measure a life in years or any other unit of time? We should instead calculate our age by our number of smiles, total decibels of laughter, the volume of our tears, pages read in books, the collective light intensity of sunsets and sunrises we've witnessed, times our hearts were broken and fixed, our kisses, orgasms, hangovers, awe-inspiring views. Oh, and uh, by the way, we're all gonna die. I'm Michael Colville Anderson. Welcome to my happy place, my podcast where I attempt to self-medicate myself against overthinking about impending mortality with tiny happy pills of positivity. These are the 100 things I'll miss when I'm dead. I remember first being shocked by the prospect of death at the age of 16. I had hungrily consumed the complete works of Ernest Hemingway over a period of a few months after first discovering his writing. I would hand in one book at the library and loan the next one until I was done. I then discovered a biography of the man's life and set out to explore this character that was already leaving an indelible impression on me. I reveled in the tales of his life, but I had no idea what was coming. Even now, I remember with alarming clarity what it was like to read that he had killed himself back in 1961, took his favorite shotgun, placed his forehead against the barrels, and blew his head off. Given his date of birth, I had assumed he was long dead by the time I started reading him in 1984, but this revelation rocked me to the core. I was thrust into a lifelong contemplation of death and a relentless fear of it. Here in my early 50s, little has changed. I sincerely don't feel like I'm exaggerating when I say that virtually every single day over the past three and a half decades, I have thought about my own mortality. Now, I'm acutely aware that that might sound like a pretty depressing thing. But while not entirely pleasant, I seem to have accepted this reality. As I grow older, it hasn't softened or hardened. It's just become more real. My primary anxiety regarding the inevitability of my own demise is that it will happen before I'm done with all the things I want to do. It certainly doesn't help that I'm creative because the list of things to do constantly grows and will never be finite. Q. More anxiety. In high school English class, we were tasked with writing an essay about where we saw ourselves in 10 years. I was convinced that I would be working as a writer, living in Fiji, and would have won a gold medal in cycling at the Olympics. By one scale of measurement, achieving two out of three ain't bad. I've made a living as a writer, and I've lived in Fiji. By another, I never got that damn gold medal. Didn't even come close. Barely even tried, to be honest. The knowledge that I am now too old to compete in any elite sport dogs my thoughts to no end. I still have a hard time accepting that I won't be selected for the national football team or the starting 11 for Arsenal. Never mind how unlikely that has ever been. My first tangible fear of death was in 1989 at 10,000 meters on an Air New Zealand flight from Honolulu to Auckland. I was heading out to explore the world with a backpack. I had always been comfortable flying up to that point, but then I started to focus on the small screens that showed our position over the Pacific. The closest land was a small island 800 miles to the east and another one 600 miles to the west. Wait, what? If the engines died and the 747 had to glide to safety, they wouldn't make it to either island, and neither of them, I was sure, had a runway that could handle a large passenger jet. Mayday, mayday. That was the first time I experienced anxiety. Now I spend half my life traveling for work, but I'm never comfortable with flying. I've managed to rationalize it, however, down to feeling anxiety at takeoff. Once the seatbelt sign is turned off, I can relax. In the years after reading about Hemingway's death, I lost three grandparents, and while that saddened me, they were old and lived far away. I was sad for my parents more than for myself. Luckily, I haven't experienced an above-average amount of death in my life. I've lost an older brother, an adult niece, and my parents. All incredibly sad events. But statistically, with the huge family I ended up with, the percentages are low. Apart from an adopted younger brother, I'm the youngest of five much older siblings, so I can expect to see them go before I do, statistically speaking. 
This certainly doesn't help with my internal struggle against thinking about mortality. In spite of my anxiety about death, I have always tried to get the most out of life. I think I was going to do that anyway, regardless of being launched into overthinking about mortality. 2020 has caused many of us to take stock of life. Slow down, reflect, readjust. When pleasures are removed due to restrictions and lockdowns, you amplify the pleasure of what you have left. I decided to compile a list of the things I'll miss when I'm dead. It started at the back gate to my building's courtyard here in Copenhagen. I was rather drunk from a cracking evening at my local wine bar, and I took out my keys to unlock the gate. The technique I have fine-tuned pleases me, and I've included it on this list. But I thought, man, all the work that has gone into fine-tuning this technique, and then you die, and it all disappears. I realized that it is the simple, personal pleasures that define us and how we live our lives that matter most. Far more than the list of things we're not doing, but think we should be. Death is the server coming up to your table with the bill, informing you that the bar is soon closing. Let's have one more drink. Number one, waking up. Waking up is cool. It's pretty much one of the clearest signals you have that you're not dead yet. I suppose when you're constantly mulling over the inevitability of impending death and start compiling a list of things you'll miss when you cross the line into the dark void of nothingness, it's a no-brainer to start with this. I'm going to miss waking up. For me, personally, waking up is an instant power surge in the brain. Regardless of how tired I am, the mainframe fires up and starts processing information. Most often I start thinking about what creative work I have on my to-do list that day or what errands I have to run. I get that this might sound a bit stressful to other people, but I thrive on it. I always need to be thinking about something, and that starts from the moment I slide out of sleep. There are, absolutely, days where I need more sleep because, you know, jet lag, a late night, and or hangover, and where waking up is the last thing I should be doing. If my serotonin levels are low, my thoughts can be darkened by negativity, but the brain is working, and that's generally a good sign. It defines my existence in some weird way. I'm not the guy who leaps out of bed and starts doing 100 push-ups. I can be sleepy and groggy and need to gear up for the physical aspects of the day ahead. I can crawl reluctantly out of bed and almost fall over trying to put on my pants or bump my head on the closet door as I bend over to pick up a shirt off the floor. But I'm thinking, processing, planning all the while. Come to think of it, I won't miss sleeping. I enjoy it, and luckily I'm good at sleeping like a rock. Dreams are a hoot too. As an aside, I enjoy being woken up by a dream going out to pee in the middle of the night and keeping the dream cooking on the back burner until I continue it when I get back into bed. I have no idea if other people do that. But by and large, I prefer to be cognizant, conducting my thoughts, creative pursuits, and sensory impressions of life like an orchestra conductor from the moment I wake up. Number two, the gradual advance of the light. When you live in the north, you are at the mercy of the light. It ghosts you like a douchebag on a dating app all winter and then shows up so gorgeous, sexy, and charming in the spring that you take it back. Every single time. I can speak to elderly citizens on the street who have lived through scores of winters and they'll say, oh, the days are getting longer in the early spring with an amazed look on their face like it's the first time they're witnessing it. My enthusiasm matches theirs. We're giddy. All of us. For me, spring starts on December 22nd each year, the day after the winter solstice. That's the day that the days start getting longer. Sure, only by 30 seconds or so, but I'm an optimist. Well, okay, an optimist who is a sucker for punishment, because I still have January and February to get through. But I'll take that extra sliver of light. I'm writing and recording this in November. The weather reports here in Denmark include the length of the day, which is 8 hours and 18 minutes today, and the times of the sunrise and sunset, 7.46 and 16.04 respectively. Then there is the brutal addition of one single mocking sentence. The length of the day is shortened by 9 hours and 14 minutes. This is using the longest day of the year, June 20th, as the reference. 
For six months of the year, it is the most depressing sentence to read each and every day. But on December 22nd, it changes to the length of the day is lengthened by dot dot dot. And suddenly, it is the most beautiful sentence imaginable. If you don't live this far north, this light transition may be difficult to understand. Oh, how I envy the equatorials for their structured solar rhythm. The sun rises and sets at the same time every day. A timed, authoritative light switch that is unchangeable. On the other hand, I couldn't dream of giving up the experience of the gradual advance of the light. For a month or two after December 22nd, the days get incrementally longer, with an addition of a minute or so. That increases to two or three minutes as we get into the end of January. I notice it first on my back stairs. In midwinter, I walk down the stairs to the back courtyard to the bike shed at around 8 o'clock in the morning, and it is pitch black. By the end of January, however, the light starts to creep in, and the contours of the stairs are gradually more visible day by day. At some point in the spring, I'm making coffee in the morning and realize I didn't even turn on the light. I didn't need to. Every minor event where I notice the light encroaching triggers joy. Literally joy. With a tickle of giddiness. Here's the thing about light. It's measured in a unit called lux. On a moonless overcast night, you get about 0.0001 lux. The lighting in an average family living room is about 50 lux. In the cold, frugal heart of the Nordic winter, it rarely rises above 400 lux. In contrast, on a sunny summer's day, we are splashed with upwards of 100,000. What a pleasant shock to our system as it returns in the late winter, early spring. We're gradually fed more and more lux. Nature boosting the doses every day. And then in the first sunny days of spring proper, we experience a rush that boosts our energy levels. It changes our personalities. It makes us happy and, yeah, horny as well. Understandable, perhaps, that we experience it as though it was the first time every single year. Then there's the ever-changing angles. On the equator, the sun dutifully rises and sets at the same fixed points on the horizon. In the north, it swings wildly between winter and summer. It also hangs low over the horizon in December and high in June. Throughout my home, I notice these angles as the seasons change. Light comes in from different directions, illuminating new things. The light catches on an open window across the street and bounces into my apartment, into corners direct sunlight normally never reach. Shadows shrink and grow and move across the floor. In the beginning of May, it begins. The light nights. That period of around three months when the sky doesn't totally get dark at night. Here in Copenhagen, the northern horizon assumes a certain kind of blue. It's kind of cobalt, but like most beautiful things, it's hard to define. Copenhagen is located at the latitude of 55 degrees, 40 minutes, 34 seconds north. That's about the same as Moscow in Russia or Edmonton in Canada. In the other Nordic capitals, Helsinki, Stockholm, Oslo, Reykjavik, it's even brighter during the summer. Farther north, of course, the sun doesn't set at all. I can tell you, man, it is wild to go camping in the Arctic in Norway and swim in the Norwegian Sea at one in the morning in bright sunlight. You have to experience the midnight sun at least once. Personally, I like being on the border. In the middle of the night during summer in my city, the sky is dark to the south, but yeah, like I said, light to the north. There is still a transition between night and day, however fleeting. There are still sunrises and sunsets. I'm literally experiencing a rush of emotions as I record this, like I did when I wrote it down, until I realize that it's quarter to four on a November day right now. The sun will set in 18 minutes. I'm lost somewhere between, oh, this winter will never end and the spring will return. It always does. It is a constant roller coaster of emotion, this yearning for the light. Number three, cleaning. I cherish the mental rewards of cleaning up my home. 
It's satisfying to wipe, vacuum, and wash. Humans are territorial and feel a need to protect their habitat with doors, windows, and locks, but also to beat back the march of invasive species like crumbs, stains, smudges, and dust. While I can track the cause of the first three invaders to the human presence within my four walls, more specifically my clumsy teenagers, the latter remains the most mysterious. I have learned that one of the ingredients in the dust cocktail is dead skin. That might freak some people out, but for me, it gives an odd sense of ownership. My kids and I are not dead yet if our bodies continue to shed skin, so that is a good sign. Although my trip down the dust rabbit hole on the internet has revealed that while other ingredients include fibers from carpets and furniture, the majority of dust originates outdoors. I suppose I beat myself with a big stick by having a home where the windows are open as much as possible. Indeed, they never close between April and October, and during the winter, they are opened regularly. Like any Nordic worth their salt, my home is an expanse of hardwood floors that allows dust to gather into balls like so many tumbleweeds on the prairies. Shoving the nozzle of the vacuum into the corners is a glorious, satisfying experience. Human one, nature nil. I don't know about you, but I tend to keep certain areas of my home cleaner than others. The kitchen, bathroom, and living room, for example, but I often neglect my bedroom. Dust accumulates on flat, smooth surfaces, and I admit that I allow it to happen, thickening into a fur as I let it think it has the upper hand. I'll sometimes run my finger through it, as though gauging depth and consistency staring at the dark gray concentrated smudge on the index finger of my right hand with curiosity and lethargy. All until I succumb to guilt and wipe it clean and experience that strange sense of accomplishment, a fresh start, a new beginning, a small victory in the war against decay. Number four, voting. I am a big fan of functioning democracy and I'm going to miss having a voice. I think it's wild that one of the simplest actions a human can perform, writing a little X that barely exceeds a centimeter of graphite from a pencil, is part of deciding who will be allowed to govern us. I have voted in three countries in my life, but living and voting here in Denmark is an extra pleasure. It's almost a national event. Voter turnout in national elections hovers around 80%, so you know that you're in this with your fellow citizens. Standing in line at the local school to cast my vote is enjoyable. You can feel the democracy and the solidarity all around you. It's also a lot like betting. You're never sure your team is going to win, but you slap down that metaphorical coin and place your bet nonetheless. Number five, throwing things. I have a great arm. You don't want to meet me in a snowball fight or see me walk up to whatever throwing game you might be running at an amusement park. It is simply one of the things I am most pleased about in the scope of my physicality, which I admit is strange since I have little practical use for this ability in my daily life. Nevertheless, oh, I love throwing things. Overhand, sidearm, underhand, bring it on. I'm that guy in his 50s at the beach who chucks out a piece of driftwood and spends half an hour trying to hit it with pebbles. Although, that was me in every other decade of my life as well. I love making the minor adjustments in my throwing technique that cause the pebbles to land closer and closer to the target and then hit it consistently. Or to ramp up the force of the throw in order to exceed the distance of the previous one. Don't even get me started on skipping stones. I have spent over 40 years trying to beat my personal best of 32. Established at the age of 12, on a glass-like pond in the wilds of the Northwest Territories. And yes, it is depressing to Google this and find out that the world record is currently 88. I will judge you brutally for your ability to throw and catch. If you ask me to pass you something that I deem throwable, you can expect it to come sailing through the air in a gentle arc. I'll study your reaction time and your catching technique. If you toss me something, I'll judge the throw and I'll catch the object. Unless, of course your throw is dismal. Like I said, there are little practical uses for this in my daily life. Except, perhaps, for one. What dad doesn't want to win prizes for his kids at an amusement park? My daughter, in particular, established years ago that she is guaranteed to head home with a stuffed animal if there are any throwing games on offer. Hey, 
you take whatever wins you can get as a parent. Although, it's a win-win for both of us. Number six, the varying salinity of oceans and seas. The last spring and summer were unusually warm and delicious, and I went down to the harbor daily to work, read, and enjoy the sun. The water in Copenhagen Harbor is fed by the Baltic Sea, which is so low in salinity that visitors often think they're swimming in fresh water. This water is my baseline. I know it well. After countless swims in the spring and early summer, I went on holiday to Greece, and the first dip in the Eastern Mediterranean gave me this experience that I'm on about here. I've noticed it my whole life, but man, it never gets old. With much higher salinity in the waters of the Mediterranean, my brain had trouble understanding why I suddenly was so buoyant. It isn't logical. It takes a day or two to get used to it. And then, the reverse. After a month swimming in the Mediterranean, I returned home and the weather was still epic. The first leap back into Copenhagen Harbor elicited a sense of minor panic. I had to work to get back to the surface. And once my head was above water, I had to put more effort into staying afloat. That sinking feeling, quite literally. Cue another period of adjustment that lasts for a couple of days. When my son was 10 years old, we stopped over in Abu Dhabi on the way home from a work trip in Australia and planted ourselves firmly in a large hotel with five swimming pools. Bonding time between dad and son. The temperature was 47 degrees each day, but it was so dry it made it survivable. We hung out by the pools and water slides for hours on end. One day, we went down to the hotel beach to have a swim, to switch it up a bit. Once in the water, my kid turned to me and said, Dad, this water is so weird. It's easy to swim in. The Persian Gulf is one of the saltiest seas in the world. My fascination with the salinity was handed down to my offspring. The Baltic is fed by countless freshwater rivers and streams fueled by melting snow that keep the salinity low. The Mediterranean has less freshwater input and the Persian Gulf hardly any at all, which increases salinity. I get that. Knowledge can often water down wide-eyed wonder, but knowing the reasons for the varying salinity in oceans and seas does absolutely nothing to diminish my childlike fascination with it. It will always be cool. Well, except after I'm dead. Number seven, handwriting. Hey, I'm not even dead yet, and I miss handwriting. Calling it the decline of an art form is being kind. It fell off a cliff completely. I've always typed fast, and it's an effective way when you're trying to transform thoughts into text, but for two-thirds of my life, I scribbled. Only recently, I decided to revisit handwriting. I have a huge pile of journals that I started when I was 17 years old. And when I started rereading the decades of writing, I was fascinated at my scrawls and scribbles. There is no real consistency. There are at least six different styles of my own handwriting, and I've tried, unsuccessfully, to decipher patterns. There are pages and pages of the same even strokes, and then a burst of wildly different styles from one day to the next. When I superimpose it all in my mind's eye, it looks like all the hair swept up into a pile at the end of the day at a hairdresser's. I've always liked my own handwriting, but I am constantly irritated at, yeah, that lack of consistency. When I was young and actually had penmanship in school, <laughs> how archaic does that word sound now? I would walk the fine line between pleasing the teacher and continuously trying to develop my own style, funking it up, making it unique, experimenting with added artistic flair while still maintaining readability. Looking through decades of my own handwriting, there are so many thoughts in different written dialects. It's so interesting to me how my father's handwriting, for example, resembles that of everyone else in his generation. There was something attractive about that generational uniformity. He was born in Denmark in 1927. Personal flair was constrained to small flourishes, like how you curled the ink at the end of a word, or the way you dotted your I's and crossed your T's. But that's about it. I can sit here merely thinking about writing with a pen or pencil and feel a sense of urgency. The scrawl never fast enough to record the thoughts. A constant cat and mouse chase. But if it's the only way you have to record your thoughts, you accept that pace. Writing this text down by hand would be a torturous affair. 
words and sentences form at 70 words per minute on my screen and keyboard. Never fast enough to match my thoughts, but still keeping pace. I'm less stressed about losing a thought or idea that I want to include two sentences further on, compared to if I was writing by hand. I can't imagine what it was like for my forefathers who had to painstakingly chisel runes into wood and stone in order to get their point across. The very thought triggers anxiety in me. Nevertheless, I have returned to handwriting this year, and I'm enjoying it immensely. Starting new journals, choosing pens and pencils, rediscovering the flow, tempo, and style, marveling at the beauty of how thoughts become real as the thin lines of ink form words that will communicate ideas and emotions, stopping occasionally to massage my cramped hand and flexing my fingers to stretch the tired muscles. You've been listening to The 100 Things I'll Miss When I'm Dead. Hopefully, I'll be around long enough to whip up the next episode. Wish me luck with that, and stay tuned. I'm Michael Koval-Anderson. Thanks for listening. <laughs>